we are really fortunate today to be joined by Gavin Esler. We're going to talk about a, a number of different themes, but one of the main focuses will be his book, How Britain Ends, which is really great. Uh, I've been reading some some Hegel today for an essay and being able to break it up with some of this was a real treat. So I highly recommend that one. Um, we'll dive into it a little bit more uh, soon. One notice before we get going. Hilary Ben was meant to be joining us in person in Keynes Hall tomorrow, but he's, he's had to go and get his COVID vaccine. So um, we'll be rescheduling that for another point during term. So don't turn up tomorrow. There won't be anyone there, but we'll, we'll reschedule that for, for soon. Um, but today we've got Gavin Esler. Gavin Esler is an author, a journalist and a broadcaster. He was the BBC's North America editor before becoming the main presenter on Newsnight, a role he held for 12 years. He has interviewed countless world leaders, including Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, David Cameron, President Clinton, President Carter, King Abdullah of Jordan, and writers and artists and business leaders, including Dolly Parton, Angelina Jolie, and Elon Musk. Gavin is the Chancellor of the University of Kent and a voting member of BAFTA. He stood as a candidate for Change UK in the May 2019 European Parliament election. Gavin, a massive thank you for joining us today. You're, you're welcome, and I'm, I'm glad I'm a better read than Hegel. I've always had that. So <laughs> that's been an ambition of mine for many years. Oh, it's a, it's a small win, but it, the, the difference was significant. So yeah. we'll take that. I'm better than Nietzsche as well as a reader, I have to say. Oh, as somebody who struggled through it when I was a student. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, so but before we turn to the book, you have, have had a, a really long and a fascinating career. Um, but journalism has been at, at the core of it. So why did you first get into journalism? Why journalism? Well, I, I grew up, uh, I was born in Glasgow and grew up in Edinburgh mostly and uh, with a bit in Northern Ireland. And um, I was going to be a doctor and uh, in the Scottish system, slightly different from A-levels. I realized at the end of it that I would have to spend another seven years in Edinburgh, Edinburgh Medical School. Now, I love Edinburgh, but when you're 17 and you spent most of your life there, you're desperate to do something else. So I decided um, I'd written quite a bit, uh, even as a teenager, and I decided that I wanted to be a writer and journalist. And of course, the troubles were going on in Northern Ireland, and um, I, I wanted to work there. And after university of uh, undergraduate postgraduate uh, in Irish literature uh, Anglo-Irish literature at, um, at Leeds University I, I was a postgrad I then um, decided that I wanted to work in Northern Ireland and I have to say there weren't too many journalists volunteering to go there so I managed to flag my way to a job <laughs> I haven't regretted it because I love Northern Ireland and, the, and partly because I've got some family there as well Oh, that's great. Is there a, an interview when you look back, which is one that really stands out as, as either being your favourite or one which when you came away from it afterwards, you really felt like, wow, I'm looking at things in a slightly different way after speaking to that person? Well, quite a lot. And of course, when you when you do interviews, you don't just uh, do the interview, which is broadcast. You sit down with the person and talk with them. Um, Bill Clinton, I interviewed many times, and he was a, he's a quite extraordinary um, person. I think he's uh, he's ill at the moment. Actually, he's been in hospital with a, a blood infection, but he's extraordinary. Dolly Parton's extraordinary in another way. I tried to persuade her to run for the presidency of the United States. I think that was a wise. I would certainly have supported her. Um, and Angela Merkel is another one. Uh, and Angela Merkel has a persona on screen, which is, uh, you know, in Germany, she's sometimes called Mutti, mother, mummy. Um, and, and she is, she, she has that particular persona. She dresses in a very plain, simple way, because as she said to me, and when we had a discussion afterwards, she doesn't want to get, because women are very often judged in the way they look and so on. She wanted to kind of take that off the table. So people actually listen to what she said. And I found her, utter, I mean, this is not about her politics or Clinton's politics or any of these political uh, choices, but it's about their personality, their humanity and their empathy. And um, she's got quite a sense of humor, which doesn't necessarily always come across in either translation or on television. And I even asked her what was the thing about, you know, she stands like this, this a lot. And what she said to me, I mean, whether it was she was teasing me or otherwise, I have no idea. She said, 
when you're a woman and you don't like ha carrying handbags, you sometimes wonder, what the heck do I do with my hands when I'm having my photograph taken? And I settled on this. So, as I say, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it made me laugh. What, what was Elon Musk like? Um, techie and uh, he's a salesman. Uh, he's a very good salesman. Um, I, I have to say what, what, he, what he did uh, with me was quite clever. He, he said, uh, he showed me the car, which was the original Tesla, the quite expensive one. I think it's about 65,000 pounds now, but uh, lovely looking car. And then uh, he took me and had, I had a look in, underneath into the chassis. And he said, uh, I said to him, where's the battery? And he said, you're looking at it. And I said, I can't see it. And of course, if, if you know how the Tesla's made, the battery is all through the car and, uh, on the chassis. So he's very impressive, um, very smart. I have no idea why he's wasting his money flying around in space or attempting to. That seems to be a very odd thing to do because we've got enough problems on this planet without talking about going to, going to Mars, which I don't think is going to happen very soon. Sure. So you, I get the sense that you could have written a book on a whole range of different topics because of the, the variety of people that you've, you've worked with and the, the sorts of portfolios you've held over your career. But you chose the, the future of the UK nationalism, English nationalism. Why is this the topic which stood out for you as the one that you wanted to, to really write, to, write about? Well, I, I suppose looking back on it, the first thoughts came in 2015. The uh, 2014 was the Scottish independence referendum and independence lost, lost fairly narrowly. 2015 was a quite extraordinary watershed, much underrated, I think, in, uh, by writing and in, in, in journalists uh, writing about it. What happened in 2015 was, um, and I spent most of that election in Scotland, and it occurred to me that if the Labour Party held on to even half their seats in Scotland, that Ed Miliband would have been Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. But they were almost wiped out. They got one seat. And, uh, you know, the joke in Scotland, which can be told about other parties too, is that there were more giant pandas in Edinburgh Zoo than Labour MPs going to Westminster from Scotland, because there's two giant pandas in Edinburgh Zoo. Um, the result of that was a number of things. One was, uh, well, the reason for that in part was that Labour, the Lib Dems and the Conservatives all got one seat. And they were all almost wiped out because people in Scotland, even those clearly who had, many of those who had voted against independence were very angry that what resulted, as we now know, was uh, David Cameron focusing on UKIP and what to do about the right wing uh, small seat Conservatives in England. Uh, and resulted in the Brexit vote. And what you got in 2015 was the biggest party in Scotland was the SNP. The biggest party in Northern Ireland was the Democratic Unionist Party. The biggest party in Wales was the Labour Party. And the biggest party in England, 84% of the population. So therefore, the Westminster government was formed by David Cameron and the Conservative Party. And it did strike me at the time, this is a very funny kind of democracy. If we've got, quote, a two-party system, but we've got four parts of the United Kingdom and they've all voted for the bigger, uh, for, for a different biggest party. And the second thing about that election was that you could got 3.8 million votes. So nearly 4 million of our fellow citizens, whether you, I'm not making a case for UKIP, but I am making a case for democracy, which is if 3.8 million people vote for a political party and they get one MP, who is called Douglas Carswell, who then quits the party, so they get absolutely nothing. I'm not quite clear what kind of democracy that is. Now you can say, oh, that's the way we do things here. Well, you know, <laughs> that, that's actually the way we did things in the era of the horse and cart and the flintlock musket. It doesn't mean it's right, just because it's a tradition. And I started to look at the ways, the mechanisms by which this country supposedly works and believes it's a democracy. And just to take another example, the current government's got a massive majority of 80 with 43.6% of the popular vote. So it's not the majority party in the country, just in Parliament. And the same was true actually of Tony Blair's landslides, 43 roughly percent of the vote, massive landslides. That's just the way we do things in this country. And the, uh, so that was one part, and I'm sorry for a long answer, but it might help frame, frame things in a, in a particular way. The second thing that happened, of course, was the Brexit vote. And as a result of that in 2019, um, I happened to be at Edinburgh Book Festival. I had a 
a new book out and was talking to people there that I grew up with, including many who voted against independence. And they said, not all of them, but many of them said they were now in favor of Scottish independence because they voted to stay within the EU. And they were told the only way you can do that is to stay within the United Kingdom. And now because they're in the United Kingdom, they were being dragged out as they put it of the European Union against their will. Um, and when I said to one of them, but Boris Johnson, for example, he says he's a one nation conservative. Repeatedly, I got the view that the one nation is England, not the United Kingdom, that he doesn't speak for the United Kingdom. And a couple of months after that, and this was really the catalyst for the book, this is when I started writing it, I was in Belfast. I know a lot of nationalists and Irish nationalists in Belfast. I know a lot of Ulster Unions that my family uh, members there uh, were Ulster Unionists. And it came three days after, I think two days after perhaps, um, Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister of Ireland, met Boris Johnson at the Wirral. And Boris Johnson, as one of my friends in Northern Ireland said, threw a hundred years of Ulster Unionism into the Irish Sea by creating this, the, the border. A man who, Johnson, a man who'd said, the Irish border is no more important than the border between Camden and Westminster. So, uh, and another unionist said to me, Margaret Thatcher used to say, Northern Ireland is as British as France. Now, you can agree or disagree with any of those sentiments, but they're genuinely held, and I foresaw real trouble. Uh, and I thought it was perhaps necessary to write a book which says to unionists, what does the United Kingdom mean anymore? What does it mean to be British? And to nationalists, what do you mean by independence when we're clearly interdependent? So those were the two challenges. Sorry for a long answer, but I thought I'd try and frame the process, which has brought us to not just the book, but to what I think is the mess that we're in right now. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I think there's a couple of things from what you said there that, that sort of come to mind for me. One is the structural side of things, the constitutional side of things, the, the voting system, democracy in the UK. And the other is the, the leadership of the UK government and the people that go through these roles. And you, you talked about Boris Johnson there and in the book, you mentioned about Karen Bradley and Chris Grayling and other people who were not particularly successful in their, in their roles. <laughs> Do you, you could think say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, diplomatically put, but yeah. Do you think this is a, a problem that the leadership of the UK government can do something about, or are the structural issues really the ones that are, are sort of shaping the way these forces are playing out? Well, uh, uh, one of the questions I ask in the book is how on earth do you become Chris Grayling? I mean, how do you go through a series of senior cabinet jobs and fail in every one when you're in the probation service, reforming the probation service, it's a mess. You refuse to send books to prisoners in jail. What's from prisoners if they want to read let them read uh, and you have both things that have been reversed then you become a transport secretary and you try to get fe ferry a, a company without ferries to run a ferry service it's bizarre and I quote in the book um, a, a lorry driver I talked to who was involved in C Chris Grayling's Brexit planning which was to um, to try and create a traffic jam in Kent to see how, how we would handle it by getting lorry drivers to turn up at Manson Airport. I won't tell you exactly what the lorry driver said, but he said broadly, that man couldn't create a word deleted traffic jam. Um, you, you know, so uh, Karen Bradley, somebody who was Northern Ireland secretary and didn't know that nationalists and unionists don't vote for the same parties. I mean, how do we get such people? And I don't go into this in great detail in the book, but there's a number of reasons for that. One is, it seems to me, that you, for many MPs under our two-party system, the most difficult election they ever face is the election within their political party to get the seat. If you get the nomination as the candidate for the Conservatives or Labour in a particular seat, you will become an MP. So therefore, the electorate that matters most to you the electorate that matters most to Pretty Patel, for example, isn't the rest of us, but it's the Conservative electorate in her seat in the, uh, in the southeast of England. And the electorates 
of the political parties tend to be, not always, tend to be on the extremes of the party. In the conservative case of the conservatives, I can't remember what the median age is of conservative party members, but it's way over 60. So that is not representing your generation uh, or actually the people, people at large. So there are fundamental structural problems within our democracy, which mean that we end up with people, despite the fact we are a hugely brainy, I mean, your university has got more Nobel laureates associated with it, as you know, probably, and then China and Japan put together. Now, we don't see many Nobel laureates in the cabinet. We see people, in the case of Dominic Raab, who don't seem to know that Calais and Dover are in some kind of relationship, among other things. And there's other, he doesn't seem to know that misogyny is about actually being horrible to women, not to horrible to men. That's misandry. You know, uh, I despair. <laughs> and it's hardly surprising then that we also have, not all, I mean, some of my very good friends are politicians and they're very hardworking and they're very decent people, but others are incredibly uninformed and have had a very narrow education, including some who've been to some of our best schools and universities, an education which is rooted in the past in kind of nostalgic pessimism things were always better in the past the blitz spirit and all that and very resistant to change and therefore not actually while they work very well within parties and with a huge majority it seems to me they don't actually work for the country very well by the country i mean the united kingdom as a whole and particularly england which i think is as you'll know from the, the book tom I think England has been particularly badly served by politicians who have centralized things, taken power away from big cities. Uh, and and it, in England, you can look at Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales and think they've got something we haven't got in England, which is a, at least some kind of devolution. So power is closer to ordinary folk. And I guess what one of the effects of that, that you, you talk about in the book is the, the English nationalism, which is obviously a theme that runs throughout um, but its association with the kind of post-truth era as well as then the anti-establishment rhetoric and so on and in the book you suggest this can lead to two things one is the beginning of the breakup of the uk and the other is potentially a beginning of a process of of reunification where the unity in the united king the united part of the united kingdom starts to become a little bit more noticeable but then you see for for us to be able to take that second route and bring back some of the the unity we need to think about who we are and who we are not and why some of us are treated like them. And I assume this is the kind of question that Keir Starmer is thinking quite hard about at the moment as he prepares to, to run for, for government, at the, well, as he will be in the, in the next election. Mm -hmm. How do you go about working out who we are and, and who we are not? How do we kind of battle with that question as a, as a society? Well, I, I know Keir Starmer's got a copy of the book. He hasn't told me what he thinks of it, so we, we, we will see. And, and a number of other politicians have too. Um, I, I think part of it, part of the problem is that uh, Englishness and English nation, being English, has always elided with Britishness and been slightly confused sometimes. I mean, I, uh, Cecil Rhodes once, uh, you know, the somewhat controversial um, British imperialist once said that ask any man around the world what he would rather be in 99% of men say he'd rather be an Englishman. I don't think even in 1900 when he was still alive, if he went to a Glasgow pub or a Cardiff pub, that would have been true. So he, he elided British and, and that, that's fine. England's uh, you know, the biggest part of the union and, uh, and it's hardly surprising that that would happen. But one of the consequences of that is that Scotland, people in Northern Ireland and people in Wales have thought intensely about the different layers of nationalism if you if you want or patriotism you know uh, you support the scottish football team but you may be a, a soldier in the british army um th there have always been levels and it's been less true in england and it's been less because people in england haven't had to think about it but things have changed and think uh, uh, you know the historian james hall says from the 1996 um football matches uh, England supporters much more use the, um, the English flag rather than the British flag. And that's, that's absolutely fine. Some people get embarrassed about it. Some people um, think this has got to do with the far right, and it possibly has in some, some cases, and it certainly used to be. 
but there's nothing wrong with that. But the difference is that patriotism is about us, whoever, whoever you define us as, a sort of um, uh, what, what are we good at as a society? What are uh, supporting the English football, England football team or the Scottish football team or, or, or Britain uh, and having an idea of, of the nation. And in the case of Britain, that was always, as Linda Colley, the historian says, was always based on Protestantism, empire and war. Those three things still exist, but they're less salient now than they used to be. Um, so what does bind us together is one of the questions of the book. What, one of my great heroes is a, the Labour Party deputy leader, Arthur Greenwood, in 1939, who stood up in the House of Commons in September 1939 as Nazi troops were pouring, pouring into Poland. And from the Conservative benches, Leo Amory shouted out, speak for England, Arthur. And Arthur did and said, appeasement is wrong, we've got to fight. Now, he spoke for England, but he also spoke for British Isles, the empire as it then was, and actually basic common decency. If you ask yourself who speaks for England now, you can find plenty of voices. But if you ask who speaks for the United Kingdom from it is very difficult to find a credible voice, a voice with credibility, say in Scotland or Northern Ireland. When Boris Johnson goes to Scotland, conservatives have told me, conservatives, uh, two prominent ones, actually, uh, who I won't name, but in two separate private conversations have said, you know, when, he come, when, when the Prime Minister comes to Scotland, the SNP publicly uh, protests, but privately are delighted. And we publicly say, oh, it's great to see you, Prime Minister, and we die a little inside, because we know he doesn't sound like someone who speaks for the Union. In fact, he, when he said devolution has been a disaster, that didn't go down well with Scottish Conservatives. So, it seems we have a problem. What does it mean? And this is something that Linda Colley explores too. What does Britishness mean, if anything, for most people in the 21st century? And who speaks for it? And who makes the case for it? And it's very difficult to answer those two questions, it seems to me. And that's, that seems to me part, part, of our, part of our problem. Is, is there anything that stands out to you as being something which does unite the United Kingdom is, uh, at least from my side, it is quite hard to think of something which actually does bring us all together. I guess one potential thing is the uh, short term thing is the vaccine response, which seems to have been something which is um, a positive thing all round. But that then goes hand in hand with what went before, which is a terrible handling of, of the pandemic more gen generally. So is there something which you think unites the United Kingdom? Well, I, I thought coronavirus would unite us more, but actually... Um, if, you, if you think about it, 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 the devolved administrations have actually gone in a different way. We've all you know, been delighted that the vaccination program has, has been a success. But uh, what we've done, I say in the book, we've devolved by stealth. We have almost federalized by stealth. We don't have anything glamorous like a, a written down constitution that you can access, uh, like the basic law in Germany or the American constitution. We've got the sort of hodgepodge, which I'm saying, <laughs> It, it baffles most people uh, of the uncodified rather than unwritten constitution. But what we have done is we've said, you know, the, the NHS brings us together. The BBC, to an extent, brings us together. But these are devolved very much. Of course, the ethos is, is broadly the same. But there are four chief medical officers in the United Kingdom, one in Scotland, one in Wales, one in Northern Ireland, and one in England. And the one in England speaks for, for Britain. So we've kind of... Uh, what, one of the things that irritates me is when, when, um, when people, and they, they tend to be uh, people like Lord Frost, who suggest we have muddled through for generations. We don't muddle through, we just muddle. <laughs> you know? and, and many of the big changes in, in, in to the British constitution had been the result of muddling until somebody starts killing somebody. So... Uh, more than 20% of the United Kingdom seceded from the United Kingdom in 1921, when the 26 counties of Ireland left. And they left because we had muddled as a United Kingdom for 30 or 40 or 50 years about what to do about Catholicism and about Ireland and about home rule. And when we finally came to a decision, it was 1914 and the war started. And as you know, the history was, it was appalling. 
So we didn't muddle through to provide votes for women. They demonstrated and they made the case for it. And eventually governments were embarrassed into it. What I fear now is that we're sort of muddling through constitutionally and it will take something quite uh, unappetizing for many people in order to shake in particular people in England to realizing that this matters to them. So just for example, it, it, I, I talked a lot to audiences across England. I was, I was at one in around Oxford last weekend. And if you ask what would happen if Scotland were to obtain independence and the hands shoot up and say, well, it'd be very difficult for them. What would they do with this? Song? And I said, no, no, for you, what difference would it make for you? And the answers are quite profound if you think about it, because Scotland, an independent Scotland, almost certainly now would be able to join the European Union. So there would be some kind of border anyway on the island, this island that we're on. It's not going very well in Ireland. How would it be managed? What would happen to the independent nuclear deterrent, which is in Scotland, which the SNP and other nationalists, uh, nationalists want rid of? Where would that go? Um, would it? Would they sort of park out halfway up the Thames? How, how, would, how would it that work? What would happen to the United Kingdom's permanent five seat at the United Nations uh, on the Security Council? Because when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia had to apply for that seat and nobody objected. Now, if, if England or England and Wales were to apply for the United Kingdom seat, would France object? Would Joe Biden or his successor think it's a great idea? Or would he think hmm, maybe India or Nigeria or Brazil um, would, you know, so, th and there's, 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 there's other questions too about, about for instance, Scotland seceding from the Union would be 32% of the land mass, and it'd be more than 60% of the sea area. And we've already seen the enormous fuss made about British fish. Well, where would the fish be caught? Because 60% of them, presumably, would be in Scotland or Scottish territory waters. So uh, I'm not saying anything of these things should happen, will happen. Well, I'm not making recommendations. I'm just making observations that if you don't think about the future, it will happen anyway, and you will have no say in it. And that is what I've, I've detected with the complacency at Westminster about this. And it's quite profound. Do, do you think it is possible for an issue like this, I guess, especially in England, to become an issue which is a politically powerful one that could lead to the sorts of bigger constitutional changes that you think could be made? There was a really interesting line in your book, which was that like all matters rooted in national identity, the English-British confusion is trivial until it's suddenly serious. And it kind of feels like we could sleepwalk into all of this and then all of a sudden realize we lose our seat in the P5, our geopolitical position starts to really fall and our influence in the world. And then the more personal and direct issues that you, you talk about. So it feels like a really important thing, but among climate change, COP26, recovery from COVID, all the rest of it, where does it all fit? Yeah, I mean, I, I accept that talking about constitutional matters is quite boring for most people until it's not. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you're right, to, I mean, because one of the scenarios I paint is essentially Scotland in the, in the European Union, you would therefore have from County Kerry in Ireland to the Polish, to Poland, from Greece up to Shetland and the Nordic countries, you would have essentially Europe united without England, which is exactly what gave Henry VIII and all many succeeding monarchs nightmares. That's why there was a, the union of the crowns against Catholicism and the fighting against France for, for you know, the Hundred Years War and other things, uh, and, and fighting against Germany and even uh, joining NATO against the, the Soviet Union. So it would be profound, but your question is, is very acute, which is, uh, do, does anybody care now? Because there's so many other things we care about, like, can we get petrol? Are we going to have Christmas? Are we going to get a turkey? I mean, those are, those are the things people care about. Yeah. And they're related also to the fact that our political system is producing um, 
leaders and results which to me do not seem fundamentally democratic and that is a real problem we have a two allegedly a two-party system but we have many competing parties in different areas which seem to speak more to the people uh, of those areas so it's all connected but your your main point i think is absolutely right what would make people sit up and take notice and i suspect as always in in british history what made people take notice of Ireland in 1916 was unfortunately when people, you know, rebelled and there was horrific carnage in Dublin. Uh, what makes people take notice is when things tend to go wrong. Now, uh, Scottish independence will not go away. It will be a story for this decade, and it may be at the end, by the end of the decade, Scotland will be independent. And when I've looked at what, um, supporters of the current government say about that. George Osborne, for example, uh, said in an article in January this year that um, Boris Johnson could go down in history as being a worse prime minister even than Lord North, who lost the American colonies, because Boris Johnson could lose the United, United Kingdom. And, but he ends, <laughs> Mr. Osborne ends his analysis by saying the only way to prevent this vote at all. Now, I don't think that's a very positive message for the unity of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Do you think it's inevitable now that the, the United Kingdom will break up or at least Scottish independence? I think it's inevitable. Um, but I do think, for instance, the arguments against Scottish independence, that Scotland's too weak, too small, too poor, uh, they can't do without us, all those arguments are, are vacuous, frankly. I mean, you could make every one of those arguments about Ireland in 1921. Uh, you could actually make every one of those arguments about Brexit. You know, it's an economic disaster or whatever, and it didn't stop people. And in Ireland in 1921, Ireland left the United Kingdom in much, much worse circumstances than uh, modern Scotland would leave the United Kingdom. Again, I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying, the fact is that Ireland now is a richer country per capita than England. It wasn't in 1973 when Ireland and the United Kingdom joined the European Economic Committee, third GDP per capita of, of England. Now, it's the other way around. Ireland is much richer, a country of 5 million people. And I've talked to um, SNP MPs and MSPs who say Ireland is a great example of what we could do. A small English speaking country of Western Europe with some great universities, some very intelligent people. And, uh, you know, in the case of Ireland, it's had a very competitive tax rate to attract business. And Ireland is doing very well. So the arguments against um, Scottish independence are not really being made coherently in Westminster or elsewhere. There are plenty of arguments. It will be disruptive. It will be difficult. Uh, what do you mean by independence? What, what was on offer in 2016 was that uh, an independent Scotland would keep the Queen as head of state, would keep the pound, and therefore would keep some relationship with the Bank of England. And inevitably, there would be some kind of defense relationship about this island. I think that's these islands. I don't think that, uh, I think that's obvious. But that's quite a dependent or interdependent independence, if you see what I mean. So th th there are many, many discussions that could be made, including to say to people in Scotland, well, what would keep you in? What do you need? Uh, do you need more, you know, more, more powers? And is that acceptable in England? Because it wasn't post-2014. The discussion has got to be made, but it reduces it to kind of cartoons to say you couldn't possibly do it because you'd be too poor. That's a really interesting point that, that you made about the uh, England as, a, as an independent state and that it could work if it took some lessons from, from Ireland and, and so on and so forth. So, how do you do you see that unfolding? If it was to, if the UK was to break up and England was to um, become an independent state, what do you think that would look like? In my head, I just have assumed that that is a an, an obviously negative thing and geopolitically super weak and loads of problems with that. But there are loads of small states that I assume make it work and are, and are really successful, as you as you point out. Well, yeah, but the key the key thing why was Ireland much poorer than England 
1973 and is much richer than England in 2021 because Ireland is joined with nearly half a billion other people in the European Union and England, and England particularly, decided to get out of it. Uh, but Scotland wants to be in it so, and, and would be welcomed. I mean, uh, all the signings I've taken with people who know uh, the European Union and its mechanisms say it's a very different case for Scotland in 2014, when it was in the EU, to break away from an EU state, that would have gone down really badly. But now, if Scotland were to break away from a state which has left the European Union, that would, of course, <laughs> you can imagine how Macron would uh, would regard that. Well, please come and join us. Our uh, the old alliance with the with the Scots dating back to the you know 13 and 1400s. It would um, so so. England wouldn't be in that position. England, as it currently is, out of the EU, would be, I'm afraid, going from Great Britain to Little England because it would be surrounded by a, um, a vast trading block of which it was not a part. Now, it works, for, it works for Switzerland, but as you know, the Swiss relationship with the EU is very intimate and is one that we could have had as we, as we Brexited. Cool. So let's turn a little bit to the, the big solutions questions. Where do we go from here? There, there's loads of other problems that the UK and the rest of the world is, is facing at the moment. How, how do you see us beginning to get a grip on these forces which are pulling the UK apart? Uh, well, it would take political leadership and it would take credible political leadership. And I have to say that, uh, for instance, in Northern Ireland, we have a prime minister who promised uh, essentially that what is happening now would not happen. And we have a Brexit deal which was agreed and which was declared to be excellent and is now being revisited in terms of Northern Ireland. So, and this is not unnoticed in Scotland where people have a great deal of fellow feeling for, for, uh, for, uh, for Northern Ireland because many of the Protestants in particular in Northern Ireland uh, have got Scottish roots and uh, there are many people in the west of Scotland in particular who've immigrated from Ireland and come to Scotland in the past 150 years. So um, I don't think that uh, Boris Johnson is the right messenger with the right message for keeping the country together because he's not trusted and it's as simple as that and we can dance around it but uh, I think we have we have to say it. What could happen, however, what I suggest is that we recognize where we are, which is the sense, the sense of federalization by stealth. And we do two things broadly. One is we reckon that, recognize that England in particular has been shortchanged and the great cities of England in particular, um, Manchester, you know, Newcastle, uh, uh, Birmingham, Liverpool and others have got strong voices and strong senses of identity. And we give more powers back to them and not do what has happened since 1979, which is essentially to ask local government to do more things and to give it less money to do it. And that's a real problem. Uh, and you can see with local mayors, they seem to be working. People, people in Greater Manchester like the idea of being from Greater Manchester. Of course they should be, do, it's, it's a great place. And Andy Burnham in a sense doesn't speak for everybody, uh, but he does speak for some of them. Uh, and gives them a voice in national politics. Now, what's wrong with that? And it would try to, it would be an attempt to at least change the balance within England itself and take more away from Westminster. But we've got to recognize that our so-called democratic system isn't very democratic, uh, right from the House of Lords, which is a totally bizarre, uh, I mean, it is really um, a camel designed when it should be a horse. It just doesn't kind of work in various ways um, and giving away more power from Westminster because Westminster is the key to this would be part of the solution but the problem and I say it in the book which is why I think independent the battle for independence would continue the problem is that successive governments of Westminster have not been prepared for obvious reasons to kick away the ladder up which they ascended so they're not going to I don't think we're going to see proportional representation, which would allow, for example, those almost 4 million people who voted UKIP to have had a voice in Parliament, which um, I think would have been a very odd voice, but it would have been 
at least the democratic way to go. Um, but I don't see any appetite for constitutional change. So therefore, for, from Westminster, so therefore, I assume that the appetite for constitutional change and the, the noise for it will appear. It's appearing in Wales as well, where um, Mark Drakeford has suggested the union as it is currently constituted is over. That's the Labour First Minister of Wales has said that. In Scotland, the move towards independence will continue unabated. And in Northern Ireland, some very interesting things are going on there. Because if there were to be an election within the next uh, year or so, who knows what will happen to the Northern Ireland Parliament. But it's quite possible that the biggest political party will be Sinn Féin. Now, that, I think, will cause considerable problems for the British government. And indeed, it will cause considerable problems in Northern Ireland itself. So things will happen anyway. They may not happen in Westminster, but they will happen elsewhere and they will change everything. OK, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Well, we're going to take some some audience questions and we'll take a few that are coming in from online. But I'll ask you first one that was sent in beforehand, um, which is that so you have made it pretty clear that, that Boris Johnson's not the person to, to solve some of these problems. What about Keir Starmer? Does does a Keir Starmer as, as Prime Minister alter some of the, the dynamics here and, and take us a little bit closer to keeping a, a united kingdom? Well, this isn't a comment for or against Keir Starmer, but uh, Conservatives uh, uh, talking about Boris Johnson's impact. And I said to each of them, this is two separate conversations. Uh, what would save the union? And they both said a Labour government. Now, they weren't, <laughs> and then we laughed, partly because it doesn't look very likely at the moment, but you never know. Uh, so whether it's Keir Starmer himself, but there is an issue there for Keir Starmer, which is who is the Arthur Greenwood of today? Who is the credible English person? And it has to be an English person who says the union of the United Kingdom is worth saving. And it's something if, if, there is, if there's more trouble in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, if, if Scotland were to go a different way. So it is possible. And ju just on that point, you know, um, Sir David Amos, the awful, awful murder of Sir David and the murder of Joe Cox. We have talked a great deal about that in the past week. What we haven't talked about is that the previous 30 years the murder of Aerie Neve MP, the murder of Robert Bradford MP, the murder of um, Sir Anthony Berry in the Brighton bombing and four other people in which the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was almost killed. They were all attacked by various factions of Irish Republicanism. Murdered in just as awful and horrible circumstances. Why is that not happening now? from Irish terrorism because of the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 and because both the United Kingdom and the Irish Republic were in the European Union. And that meant for those people who really cared about a border being there, it's there in law and on the paper. For those who didn't want a border in Ireland, it doesn't really matter because you can go backwards and forwards. It has transformed life in Ireland. It has stopped MPs being murdered by Irish terrorists. And now we are in a position where the British government is threatening to tear up the Northern Ireland Protocol and replace it with goodness knows what, which seriously damages what has happened and what generations of politicians of different parties work for in Northern Ireland. And I think that is a truly despicable act and it will rebound on us. And we should really think about this because an attack on a de democratically elected politician, whether you agree with him or her or otherwise, is an attack on all of us. And it used to happen with regularity in Irish circumstances. And it doesn't happen now because people were to them. And tearing that up is an act of at least terrible carelessness. We, we've got a, another question which has been sent in, which 
picks up on some of the themes we, we've talked about uh, earlier on. What does the COVID-19 response in the UK tell you about the strengths and the weaknesses of the United Kingdom? Um, well, some of the strengths are that we have got uh, some amazing people who are, we've got incredible scientists. We have got really, really credible researchers. We've got great universities, uh, you know, the, the AstraZeneca Oxford uh, vaccine. We have got a national health service, which is full of people who work incredibly hard and who are represent the best of us. Um, but we've also got um, a prime minister who missed the first five COBRA meetings. We have also got uh, a series of very, very peculiar decisions. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy for anybody. Uh, and we have also got 37 billion pounds of our money spent on test and trace, which didn't seem to work. And we have an absolutely damning report of our democracy working well to say, uh, cross party, people having a look, MPs having a look at how things have gone. So it's a mix, it's a mixed picture. It's certainly not all bad. And I think we're all glad to have, uh, most of us are glad to have vaccinations, apart from those who, for some reason, uh, don't believe the science. Uh, there are some very, very good things about this country and about how how we can pull together and how, how we have some incredibly smart people. But it's also true that we have made blunders which seem extraordinary, actually. And I think, we, you know, we've had one inquiry, but we will hear a lot more about that too. Whether the initial response of the government, in particular the prime minister, was not just shambolic, but actually cost us a lot of lives. And even now, the differences in the United Kingdom, I mean, uh, I was in Scotland uh, two months ago, and at one of the tourist sites, the uh, in the shop, there was a lady at the door handing out masks to essentially people from England who didn't know that they had to wear them in Scotland because there, there were different rules. And so it, it's pointed up a number of things, but it's uh, among those, it's pointed up some of the weaknesses of people who have got a landslide victory in Parliament and are taking decisions, but they're decisions which we will have to look at, I think, in the future. Sure. I'll give it a few more seconds to see if any other audience questions will come in, either through the, the YouTube or if you're, if you're on the Zoom, feel free to to stick something in the chat or, or ask something live as well. And if not, I've got one more question from myself and we'll see if any other questions come in whilst I, I ask this. What's, what's, what's next for you? Um, what's next for me? Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to meet some uh, European diplomats uh, in the next hour. That's what's next to me, next for me. Uh, and then uh, I'm doing quite a few book festivals over the next uh, few weeks. And I've also got a new, um, I, I did a podcast series called The Big Steel, which is uh, steel, S-T-E-A-L, as in theft, which is about Vladimir Putin. And we won, won a couple of awards with our first series. And I've just, uh, I'm just updating it with another three. And the first episode of that has come out is is out now. So you can get that free just about anywhere, the big steel. And it uh, includes at least uh, one of the episodes includes interviews with people who have been poisoned by Russian agents and what it's like being poisoned. And also I ask them a very simple question, which is if Vladimir Putin didn't like you, why weren't you just shot? And the answers to that, I, I will leave to the podcast, but they're very, very interesting. And they say quite a lot about the the mindset of uh, the leader of of Russia, <laughs> wow. and they're very brave people. Some of them, the ones that we talk to, that sounds fascinating. I think I'll definitely ha have a look at that at the moment. I've also just got, got to ask you: you had a, a little dabble in in politics. Is that something that you would write off now, or, or something that maybe you might think about uh, sometime in the future? Well, look, I, I, I joined uh, Change UK because it wasn't really a political party. Um, I mean, it was just that it was, a, it was a, a feeling that things were really bad in the United Kingdom and we are a lot better than this. And I still have that feeling. 
Um, but what it showed, it was very interesting. Uh, we got uh, in London, we got 117,000 votes. So thank you to all those people who voted for us. But we didn't really make any uh, any headway. And it showed a number of things. One is, if you're not in a political party with a party organisation, it's very difficult to get anywhere. Um, and secondly, it, it showed me uh, just some, some of how um, party politics works. And I met people on all different parties that I still keep in touch with. I, I met a, a, a Conservative MEP that I'm still in touch with. I'm a number of Labour MPs, Liberal Democrat MPs, and MEPs at the time, and others. Um, and you know, we have got great strengths in this country. It's just it's not always reflected in the way in which politics works. So I would, I would suggest, if I may, suggest a bit of reading to all those who are, who are joining us. Read George Washington's farewell speech to the American people in 1796. It's quite short. And what he says is that he fears that effectively all political parties will turn into factions and the factions will rule. And that is a bad way for democracy to go. And it's quite inspiring if you think how our political parties over the past few years tend to be run within the party, a party within the party. And then for instance, the current government, you're either in or out. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, you were in or out. Now it's Keir Starmer's Labour Party and so on. And is that the best way to run? I'm not quite sure what the alternative that uh, George Washington was suggesting, but it's um, it's worth having a look at. That's a great note to end on. Thank you. We'll definitely, we'll find a copy and, and send it around afterwards for to have a look at that. Gavin, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you for joining us and sharing your your insight and what you've you've written in your book, How Britain Ends. I highly recommend if you're interested um, to dive into to some of these issues uh, a little bit more. But thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening and especially to yourself, Gavin. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Tom. And thanks everybody for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>